Hello, my name is Megan. I'm a programming librarian here at the Saskatoon Public Library. We are located on Treaty 6 territory, as well as the traditional homeland of the Métis. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Sustainability Speaker Series. Presented in partnership with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, this video was recorded on a previous date. Please enjoy. This uh, series is produced by the Saskatoon Public Library in partnership with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. And information about the Saskatchewan Environmental Society can be um, found on its website, which is environmentalsociety.ca. If you would like to receive email, an email reminder before each event in the Sustainability Speaker Series, you can send an email message to the Environmental Society in the message, you should uh, indicate that you want to be notified of events in the series. The Environmental Society email address is on its website and um, that email address is info at environmentalsociety.ca. Our speaker tonight is Jason McLean. He's a professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of New Brunswick. He's also a professor in the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Saskatchewan. His law degrees are from McNeil University and the University of Alberta. Some of you may recall a talk on putting a price on carbon emissions that Jason gave in this series uh, in 2019. Jason has worked in corporate, commercial and constitutional litigation. As a lawyer, Jason has appeared before all levels of court in Canada, including the Supreme Court of Canada. Jason is a member of the Board of Directors of the Pacific Center for Environmental Law and Litigation, as well as the East Coast Environmental Law. Jason is regularly consulted on public interest in environmental law in Canada. Uh, his academic research is mainly on interdisciplinary approaches to climate change, action, climate change and um, sustainability law and policy. Tonight, Jason will be discussing the future of climate action in Saskatchewan following the Supreme Court of Canada's carbon pricing decision. And perhaps so I should warn you that we're gonna have a more time than we usually do for uh, questions, uh, the question period. So um, I hope uh, you sure to send in lots of questions, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So uh, Jason, Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Carol. Uh, it's really great to be back in uh, Saskatoon, um, even if only virtually. It's, it's been a little while uh, since I've been there, and it's it's great to be back in this uh, in this great speaker series. And it's it's wonderful to see so many people uh, tuning in. Um, no, I wasn't sure what uh, Carol's warning was going to be. Um, an, another warning that she might have made was that Jason's been out of uh, Saskatchewan for uh, about a year or a little bit over a year now. And so uh, there, there may well be uh, some people in the audience. In fact, I'd wager on the fact that there are people in the audience who know more about Saskatchewan's current approach to climate and sustainability law and policy and energy regulations and greenhouse gas emission regulations than I do. Uh, but that said, uh, what I'm gonna try and do is, I, I, and I'm not going to, to, to talk for a whole hour, I'm gonna try and talk for about 25 minutes or so, so we can have uh, a really good Q&A session, which I think is always more interesting. And the topic, as, as Carol mentioned, is uh, thinking about, and, and for me to offer some thoughts about what, you know, the, the near and midterm futures of climate policy and, and climate action in Saskatchewan might be following the Supreme Court of Canada's ruling uh, on the constitutional validity of the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act of the GGPPA, or what is colloquially known, however, erroneously uh, in, in, and inaccurately and politically, I might add, as the carbon tax uh, regulation. Uh, in Canada, but equally, uh, I think you know as I, and I, as, as I kind of hunkered down and, and did uh, you know a little bit of research to update myself on what's going on uh, 
in Saskatchewan, which is still an area of um, significant interest for me uh, because I'm, I'm still connected to the University of Saskatchewan, as Carol mentioned. Context for this talk that's just as relevant, maybe even more relevant uh, for Saskatchewan's climate action plans and policies um, is the, the conclusion of the recent Conference of the Parties, number 26 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that just wrapped up in Glasgow. And uh, I, I think in, in some ways, uh, the conclusion of that meeting casts a bit of a, a pall over, over what we're going to talk about tonight, but it's, it's important it's important context. But uh, first, I will talk very briefly about what the Supreme Court of Canada's ruling uh, said, both in terms of what's valid about the, uh, the federal regulation, but also uh, in, in a more surprising twist, what the court said uh, was invalid, potentially about federal climate action which came as, uh, as a real surprise. So first, uh, what did the court actually say? And I've, you know, I've done you the public service of going through all 616 paragraphs of the decision, and there are really only two that matter. Uh, and there, those are paragraphs 199 and 175 for those who'd like to read them uh, themselves. But what the court says is that the federal government of Canada has constitutional jurisdiction under our federal provincial division of powers to enact a minimum national price on greenhouse gas emissions that applies nationally. And that includes a minimum price that applies nationally that can raise over time. Um, and it said, and this isn't, this is, wouldn't be uh, particularly important in a non-law crowd, but because of what the court also went on to say in those two paragraphs that I just mentioned, it actually is relevant here. What the, what the court said was, is that under what's called the national concern branch of the peace, order, and good governance residual clause of the Constitution Act of 1867, that climate change is a matter of national concern, that greenhouse gas emissions is a matter of national concern. And under that specific branch of the federal government's jurisdiction, it can enact a national minimum price on greenhouse gas emissions. That's what the court says. That's all it says. And um, what does that mean uh, for Saskatchewan? Not much, really. It doesn't change anything. And in fact, this litigation, which began at the Court of Appeal in Saskatchewan, uh, doesn't change anything on the ground. So the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act has two main parts. The first part is a uh, sets out uh, charges on a series of fuels that emit greenhouse gas emissions. That's called part one. And part two uh, is called the output-based performance system. Saskatchewan has one of its own. It's called OBPS for short. And uh, the status quo ante applies. Um, so the, the federal carbon price or the regulatory charge on greenhouse gas emissions only applies in those provinces or territories that haven't themselves imposed a price on greenhouse gas emissions within those territorial or provincial boundaries that's at the, the benchmark level set by the federal government. So the part one of the GGPPA will continue to apply in Saskatchewan and part two will also continue to apply in Saskatchewan as it did before, but only partially because Saskatchewan, as I mentioned, does have its own OBPS. So to the extent that heavy industrial emitters aren't covered uh, by Saskatchewan's plan, uh, then they're covered by the, the federal government's plan. So the federal government's uh, pricing system works as a kind of a backstop uh, and captures or and regulates and puts a price on those emissions that aren't priced elsewhere. 
Um, so that will continue to apply going forward. And, and, next, and next year, the price will raise to $50 a ton. Now I can get into more of the details about how some of that works in the Q&A, but I don't wanna get bogged down in the weeds right now. The, the, the most important thing to note at, at the moment is that in terms of what the court decided, in terms of what the court said was constitutionally valid, this is really not a surprise and not a single serious law scholar in Canada thought that this constitutional challenge, which was first launched in Saskatchewan and then launched in Ontario and then launched in Alberta with a sort of a separate um, administrative action uh, launched, which also failed um, in Manitoba. Uh, no serious law scholar thought that this, this challenge had a chance. It was very clear, it was very obvious that the federal government had and has ample constitu constitutional jurisdiction to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. So there's no surprise there. Um, however, there, there was a surprise in, in the way in which the court uh, issued its ruling. And so the court was really at pains to respond to provincial concerns that regulating greenhouse gas emissions through uh, putting a price on those emissions would end up indirectly regulating every aspect of provincial and territorial economies and natural resources, uh, which otherwise fall under provincial jurisdiction under our constitution. And in fact, what the court said was that greenhouse gas regulation through carbon pricing is a very specific form of regulation. And it's only that regulation um, that applies and, and that is covered by the federal government's uh, constitutional jurisdiction. The court went out of its way to say that other forms of regulating greenhouse gas emissions that are non-carbon pricing forms, like sectoral standards on buildings and roads and transportation and electricity and agriculture and waste and forestry would not be covered and would not come under the umbrella of the federal government's constitutional jurisdiction in terms of matters that are of a national concern. So at first glance, the court with one hand has said, yes, the federal carbon pricing regime under the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act is constitutionally valid. So that confirmed what all serious law scholars thought in 2018 when the law was enacted. However, the court really went out of its way and in my uh, painstakingly humble opinion, went entirely too far in ruling out as constitutionally valid several other forms of regulation of greenhouse gas emissions. And that's going to potentially be a problem in the future because Canada's ability to meet its emissions reduction targets under the Paris Agreement are at the moment almost, well, at the moment entirely dependent on carbon pricing. And the government has signaled, but has not yet put into law, that the price will increase over time between 2023 and 2030 uh, from $50 uh, a ton to $170 a ton. And we can come back to that later, but it's highly questionable that there's broad political public support for that much of an increase in the price. So when you look at Canada's most recent climate change plan, which was released last December, and if you look at Canada's updated nationally determined contribution, so its pledge under the Paris Agreement, which was updated in the summer and which largely tracks its updated climate plan. And if you look, and we should get this plan any, at any time between December and February, 
under the recently enacted Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, the federal government has to re release a more detailed model about how it intends to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050 with interim milestones along the way. What you will see is that Canada's plan depends upon reducing emissions across several sectors of Canadian society and economy, including agriculture, including oil and gas uh, in, the, in the western part of the country, including Saskatchewan, uh, including transportation, including home heating, including agriculture, including forestry. Now the question then becomes constitutionally, how will the federal government do that? Well, in the federal government's climate change plan, it says that it's going to work with and negotiate with the provinces and cooperate with the provinces. Of course, we've already seen that movie and that's what led to this litigation in the first place. In 2016, after Canada signed the Paris Agreement, it concluded the Vancouver Declaration on Clean Growth and Climate Change, in which all of the provinces, except for Saskatchewan, agreed that putting a price on carbon emissions was the most efficient way to reduce those emissions. Saskatchewan excluded itself from that process, and then several other provinces followed suit, and it ended up in the courts, which amounted in about a three-year delay on serious discussions about national climate strategy and nothing else. It was an absolute waste of time. And it was frankly an abuse of the judicial process. So the federal government now relying on um, a newfound form of provincial cooperation raises a serious question mark about the political feasibility of uh, its new uh, pledge to reduce its emissions by 40 to 45 percent uh, by 2030 from the baseline year of 2005, when we are still not on track to meet our initial pledge, which was to reduce our emissions by 2030 from the 2005 level by 30 percent. So there's some questions there. Now, that said, uh, from a strictly legal point of view, the federal government still does have two other constitutional options. One is to use its uh, plenary power to make laws um, with respect to criminal law. Um, and it, can, it also has the ability to levy taxes. Now, neither of those strategies is uh, politically advantageous. Neither of those strategies is really uh, fantastic from a public communications point of view. So the Supreme Court of Canada's decision uh, with respect to the validity of the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act really puts the federal government into a bit of a box and uh, unnecessarily so, largely because it wanted to mollify the concerns of provinces and uphold the status quo understanding of the federal division of powers, whether or not it, that division of powers uh, gets in the way of our ability to meaningfully respond to climate change is a question that essentially will have to be settled another day. And we may in fact see uh, that, next, that next day in court, and it could come from a variety of different things that I'll talk about briefly, which will allow me also to segue into some of the aspects of, of uh, Saskatchewan's current thinking and planning and actions on climate change. Uh, one might be um, that the, the federal government has signaled, it signaled during uh, the Liberal Party signaled during the election campaign and the government has reiterated it since uh, that it plans to impose a cap on the greenhouse gas emissions from oil and gas production. Now it doesn't say uh, smartly, doesn't say that it intends to impose a cap on production levels of oil and gas, uh, but it proposes a cap on emissions uh, in 2023. Um, and that could well be uh, uh, another source of more wasteful constitutional wrangling because provinces have exclusive jurisdiction under our constitution, 
over the management of non-renewable natural resources, which would include coal and natural gas and oil. And even interestingly enough, um, the, some of the, the byproducts of, of those, including certain greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But I'm also gonna say, I don't think that that's going to happen. Uh, because the oil and gas industry has already quite loudly and publicly said that it thinks that that timeline on which it, it claims that it wasn't consulted is not realistic. And uh, generally throughout Canadian history, uh, the federal government listens uh, when the oil and gas industry complains and it will quietly step back. So I think that that's, that's one fight that we probably won't have. Another potential constitutional fight could be over um, commitments to phase out coal production, um, both for export, but also for electricity generation. And according to Saskatchewan's data, it still relies on 30% uh, of electricity generation or, or thereabouts um, comes, from, comes from coal. Uh, the majority is from natural gas and uh, about a quarter is from renewable energy. Um, Canada, in a, in a, a, as part of the COP process, signed a, a multilateral pledge to reduce methane emissions, and methane emissions arise equally from uh, natural gas production as well as uh, gas associated with oil extraction and agriculture. Um, it's, it's committed to reducing its methane emissions, not by very much, but by 30% by 2030. Saskatchewan has its own um, methane action plan with its own targets for reduction, um, although a very different, uh, well, not a very different, but a, a, a different uh, baseline year and different targets. There could be some potential um, for constitutional wrangling there. And it's very interesting in, in Saskatchewan's methane action plan, for those of you who aren't um, uh, intimately familiar with the details, uh, I find it fascinating. One of its uh, commitments is to reaffirm provincial regulatory jurisdiction over greenhouse gas emissions from the oil and gas sector, um, which is really fascinating. So, you know, obviously it, it is already signaling to the federal government uh, that it intends to defend its jurisdiction in this regard, but it's, it's not only um, defending its jurisdiction with respect to the non-renewable resources of natural gas and coal and oil, but also uh, their pollutants, their emissions. So a big part of, uh, in fact, almost the entire part of Saskatchewan's uh, methane reduction plan is to utilize carbon capture, um, utilization, and sequestration. And it, uh, Saskatchewan is, is betting essentially that uh, despite the economic challenges that it otherwise candidly acknowledges in its plan uh, with respect to commercializing um, captured methane gas and, and, and uh, transforming it into um, different commercial purposes, that that's the approach that it's going to take. Uh, it's not clear to me uh, from a constitutional law uh, point of view that they can, that Saskatchewan has jurisdiction over methane emissions, uh, but that's something that unfortunately uh, we, we may well uh, have the courts uh, opine on. There may also be conflicts, although probably not at the level of constitutional law, over Saskatchewan's choice of a baseline year, it's chosen 2015, whereas the uh, countries that signed on to the multilateral global methane pledge chose 2020 where uh, methane emissions, uh, I, there's a, there are strategic reasons for doing that, uh, obviously because of COVID-19 uh, and their, their lower amount, but the different baselines could give rise to apples and oranges comparisons, but also uh, a really looming challenge uh, will be the accuracy and validity of the measurements of methane emissions along with uh, greenhouse gas emissions more generally, but especially methane emissions. Uh, and it's, it's, it's beginning to become uh, increasingly apparent 
that a number of countries as part of the Paris Agreement are reporting inaccurate data with respect to their methane emissions. And there's evidence to suggest in Canada that methane emissions are being systematically underestimated. There was a study done in Alberta a few years ago that showed that uh, the estimates of methane emissions that were reported by uh, the oil and gas industry were um, only half of what the actual estimates were. So there's likely going to be some wrangling over that. Okay. Um, other than that, I think the most significant thing that Saskatchewan is proposing to do, SAS Power has made a, a, a public commitment to uh, increase the, the proportion of renewable energy uh, used to generate electricity to 50% or at least 50% by the year 2030 and then to increase it beyond that. Um, Perhaps uh, some of you will have uh, some better information about this, uh, but just looking at the most recently available data, that strikes me as ambitious um, because uh, right now uh, it's about 26% and the increase on a year over year average is very, very small and appears to be due to simply uh, Saskatchewan purchasing more hydroelectricity from from Manitoba, there doesn't appear to be evidence of uh, Saskatchewan making the necessary and inter upfront quite expensive uh, infrastructure investments uh, that will be required um, to, to increase the share of renewable energy. But I, I guess what I would say is uh, three things in conclusion, and then we can go, we can get into some questions and some discussion. Um, Saskatchewan's current uh, climate policy and planning uh, doesn't look any different today than it did when I started my, my uh, career at the University of Saskatchewan in 2017. Uh, it doesn't have a plan to decarbonize. It doesn't have a plan to uh, reach net zero emissions. Um, and it's essentially doubling down on oil and gas production. Now I would add, however, that's entirely consistent with the federal government's approach to climate change planning at the moment. Uh, both the, the government of Saskatchewan and the federal government are making a what appears to be an unhedged one-way bet on the effectiveness at scale and the economic efficiency in terms of price of carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration. And I suppose uh, without a plan B, which is you know a, a little bit risky and uh, definitely violates something in environmental law we like to call the precautionary principle. But uh, I was thinking about uh, what could be a faint silver lining, especially coming out of you know the the disappointing results of COP26 in Glasgow and a faint silver lining of Saskatchewan's enthusiasm and its investments in carbon capture, utilization and sequestration is in a way uh, the province is, is uh, a canary in the, in the coal mine. Uh, we do need research uh, and field testing of this technology to know whether or not it's something that's going to be feasible and effective at cost and at scale in order to scale it up such that it could be reliably part of our uh, net zero planning. And it, in, in some ways, the, the investments that um, Saskatchewan has already made and is continuing to make will give us and will yield um, some really useful uh, information, some really useful data about that. But I wanted to, in conclusion, um, draw your attention to what I think is a really telling line in Saskatchewan's latest greenhouse gas emissions report. And it says, and I quote, Saskatchewan is making efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but climate change requires collective global action. Now, I suppose there's a few different ways that you could read that statement. 
the way that I read it is that's true. I think Saskatchewan is making some efforts at reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but it's important to note that the government itself uh, is candid and acknowledges that uh, it's not its plans aren't consistent with the level of ambition set out in the Paris Climate Agreement. The government has also been candid and in fact acknowledged at the University of Saskatchewan when I was working there full time uh, that uh, Saskatchewan's uh, planning doesn't even represent uh, its fair share of Canada's initial target, which was quite ambitious. It certainly doesn't represent its fair share of Canada's updated and uh, more ambitious target under the Paris Agreement. But I suppose the other, the other way that I read that statement is, is that Saskatchewan, and I think that this, this characterization applies equally to uh, most jurisdictions in Canada, including the federal government. Saskatchewan is making a one-sided bet on business as usual and a delayed transition uh, to uh, climate change mitigation and sustainability. Um, and in saying that uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions requires global collective effort, that's absolutely true, but it also requires leadership. And thus far, both in Saskatchewan and in the Canadian federal landscape, there is no leadership in sight. And so with that, um, I'm, I'm happy to turn it over to back to the, the host uh, to moderate uh, some Q&A. Thank you, Jason. Um, we...